Today's teaching text comes out of Luke chapter 5, verse 15 through 16. It says this, Yet news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus withdrew to lonely places, and he prayed. You can go ahead, fist bump a couple of people around you. I can't say go Cowboys today because unfortunately they lost last week, but just tell them you're glad they're here and you can go ahead and take a seat. So glad you're here this morning. And uh, we said at our opening today, we're celebrating our one year birthday anniversary. And I just wanna take a moment uh, to honor uh, a few people here this morning. Uh, because when you get to a year, it, you just think about all the things that God has done over the last year. It's been incredible. Um, but I just want to take a moment to honor our launch team. This is a group of people, uh, before they saw any of this, before they even heard me preach, they believed in the vision of this church to be a part of this and help this from the beginning and the foundation. So can we just take a moment to honor our launch team and every person? And every single week, we have people who step up. We say the reason we're named Purpose Church is because uh, the church is at its greatest capacity when people use their gifts to make a difference. The church isn't just about a select few people um, who are super gifted and talented. It's about everybody coming together and using their gift. No task is greater than another task. And God wants to use all of us to be able to make a difference in building his kingdom. And God wants to use you today. Uh, we are in the third week of our series called God Will Show Up If You Want Him To. And this is based off a series that I uh, heard about uh, about six months ago from a pastor named John Tyson, uh, Church of the City in New York. He's had a profound impact on my preaching and just learning so much from him. And we're going to continue to dive into this series today. And uh, there, there's a quote from John Ortberg. He said this, Anytime you see life flourishing... It is because it is receiving nourishment from outside of itself. So one of the questions I want to ask you today is where are you getting nourishment from this morning? Like what are you feasting on? Obviously you have to eat and you have to drink and we have to do those things. But when it comes to your personal life, when it comes to your emotional life, when it comes to your spiritual life, what are you feasting on today? Because here's what I know. We live in a very public world. We, we live in a world that is marked by the public space. We live in a world that is passionate about how you look on the outside. And in order for you to have a good outside, you have to be fueled on the inside. You see, if you have a good outside, but you don't have a strong inside, it doesn't matter how great your outside is. Eventually, you are going to burn out. So the question we're asking this morning is how do we have a public presence, but ultimately, more importantly, how do we have a private presence that drives us to what God is calling us to drive towards? Because here's what I know about you. Whether you're into social media or not, whether you care about your public presence or not, we all have internal desires, you all walk in here with internal desires. You, you have a desire to be a great spouse or a great future spouse or uh, a great parent or a great employee. Maybe you desire to be financially independent, to get promoted. And whether you feel driven or not, you would describe yourself as ambitious or not. Some may more, have more drive than others this morning. Every single one of us has a drive. The question is, what is driving you? And is the thing that's driving you actually healthy? Is your private space drawing you out to experience the healthy life that God has for you this morning? And ultimately living a life where we hunger and we thirst for God. Jeremiah chapter 17 says this. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man who draws strength from mere flesh and whose hearts turn away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands and they will not see prosperity when it comes. This is a strong verse for our one-year birthday anniversary, okay? Like not exactly the most encouraging verse, but it is so important. Cursed is the man who only draws on his own willpower, Cursed on the man who, who thinks that he can do it all by himself and he is going to be okay. 
Cursed on the man who only draws nourishment from his own strength, his own power, and his own courage. They will not see prosperity when it comes. Why? Because their singular focus is about what they can do and what they need to do. And their singular drive causes them to miss out on the blessing that God has for their life. And the very fact that the reason they are where they are is because of God, not themselves. And that's what we need to be reminded of today. I mean, you've seen this. You know this. I mean, think about all the billionaires that are in our world. Yes, they've built a great business. But for many of them, their relationships have lacked. They're on their third, their fourth marriages. They built a great, uh, great business, but their drive for wealth oftentimes can distract us from what actually matters most. You see, God uh, puts these desires in our heart. God wants us to build great businesses and do these different things, but we can't forget what is driving us. Herman Bavnik says this, The more abundantly the benefits of civilization come streaming our way, the emptier our lives become. With all the wealth and power, it only shows that the human heart in which God has put eternity is so huge that all the world is too small to satisfy it. Last year on our birthday, I preached a first message. It was entitled, If You Only Knew. And essentially the message was that God has placed something in your heart And that can only be filled by God, but we live in a world that tries to fill it with so many different things. And if you're walking in today, searching for your purpose, you're searching for meaning, it is going to come from God. It's not going to come from that thing that you're pursuing today. That thing that you're pursuing today is not a bad thing necessarily, but ultimately our worth, our value, and our identity comes from God. So my question for you is, Are you rooted in God or are you rooted in self? We live in a public world and the public world doesn't care about your private life as long as your public life is good. But if your private life is not strong, it doesn't matter how long you fake it. Eventually, your public life is going to be affected. So the title of today's message, if you're writing notes, is this, The Secret Place. Turn to your neighbor and say, The Secret Place. If this is your first time at Purpose Church, we encourage you at any point, you can say amen, you can clap. We want to be a church who is passionate about God's word and what he is doing in our life. Amen? Amen. All right, Jeremiah chapter 17 says this, gets a little bit more encouraging, okay? But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Come on, amen in Phoenix, right? Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Scholars believe that Jeremiah was speaking about a real place in Israel, okay? And this place is called Gan Hashlasha. I've been practicing that all week, okay? That is not an easy word. I hit it though. That was out of the park. And uh, this is an absolutely beautiful place. It's in the middle of the wilderness garden of the three springs. And when we look at this picture, it's a beautiful picture. Um, But what you see in this public view, although it's beautiful, it is not spurred on just by the public view. The reason it looks beautiful is because there are underground springs beneath this with deep, cool, emerald blue water that help make sure that this is a beautiful view. This place is not dependent upon the public view. It's about what's happening underneath. As we celebrate our birthday today, this is my prayer for you. This is my prayer for our church in a world today that is filled with stress and anxiety and depression, and mental health cases on the rise, that regardless of your circumstances this morning, God has the ability to give you strength. He has the ability to give you what you need to walk through what you're walking through today, that although your outside circumstances may not look good at all, you can have confidence and strength in him, and you can have peace and chaos. We live in a world that has a great, wants to have a great public image, but their private place, it's not good. Like, it's not healthy. So for all of us, we need to understand that God wants to do work in our life 
in the secret place. Some of you, you're college students today. You can go to a college course and your professor may have way more uh, knowledge than you ever know. But you can have more life in your heart because of God. (laughs) Some of you, you're a secretary for your business and your boss, he may have way more money than you ever have. But you can still have more life in your heart because of what God can provide for you. And the way that you access it, it's through the secret place. Now how in the world Think about it. Jesus accomplished. How did Jesus accomplish his mission? The first 30 years of his life, he was in the secret place. We don't know too much through scripture about what he did the first 30 years. But Jesus accomplished everything he did in three years. And this was thousands of years ago. Jesus didn't have a Tesla. He, he didn't have even a, a really a horse to ride. He was walking. And he fulfilled his mission. Why? Because Jesus had access to the secret place. I mean, if you knew that you could step into a place where instantly you could have peace, where instantly your hope could be lifted, where you could be encouraged, where where you could know that there is grace for your sins and that God would always be there. If you knew that place existed, you would always go there. The way that Jesus lived out his mission, the way he sustained his mission, it was through the secret place. It's where he broke the fear of man. It's where it gave him the strength to perform signs and wonders and miracles. It came from the secret place. The key to your power, the key to your authority, the key to your security is not your outside circumstances. It's how much time you spend in the secret place. So what happens in the secret place? The secret place is where you spend time with God. It's where you connect with God. It's where you pray to God and listen to what he has for you. If you're taking notes, here are three things that happen in the secret place. Here's the first one. Your identity is cemented. We live in a modern world where constructing an identity is complex. We live in a culture that says, Define yourself. Invent your identity. And then when you invent your identity, everybody needs to affirm that identity. That's terrible advice. Here's why. Even even Freud said, you don't even know who you're going to be when you wake up. Come on. Who'd you show up today being? Did you show up today being your emotional self? Your immature self? Your mature self? Your wise self? Your, your good self, your bad self, we're different people every single day. So how in the world can we live in a world where we have to construct our identity? To simply build your life on follow your heart is bad advice, it's fragile, and we can't build a society on it. And we are now seeing the current cultural effects of living out those words. Now, if you choose your identity, you are going to need affirmation and validation from everybody around you to affirm that identity. And if they don't affirm you, it will destroy you. Now, here's the key. When it comes to your relationship with God, he's not asking you to construct an identity. In fact, he's not uh, asking you to achieve an identity. God says your identity, it is received. Your identity is, it's not conjured up through your work ethic. Your identity is given to you by God. You are who God says you are. You are not who you say you are. And this is why this is important. When it comes to your identity, stress reveals who you are and where you draw from. So my question for you, what do you do when you're stressed? Where do you draw energy and power when you're stressed? Um, before we launched the church, it was maybe two, three months before then, um, I was stressed. I was like, how are we going to launch this church? What, what are all these things going to happen? And um, my wife knew that my stress level, she could know my stress level by if I bought a milkshake from Sonic in the middle of the day. <laughs> she would see that cup, she would see that charge, and she knew, I need to ask Josh how he's doing. Because he doesn't typically just go to happy hour at Sonic and buy a milkshake every day at 3 p.m. What do you do when you're stressed? 
What's your milkshake? Some of you, I don't know what your milkshake looks like, and hopefully your milkshake's not bringing all the boys to the yard. (laughs) But do you eat? Do you binge watch Netflix? Do you go to porn? Like, where are you going when you're stressed? Where are you drawing from when pressure rises? Jesus went to the secret place for affirmation from God because he wasn't looking for affirmation from himself or from the world. Yet we live in a world where when we get stressed and we get pressure, the last thing we go to is God, and the first thing we do is either go to social media or go towards others. And we wonder why mental health issues are rising. It's because we are going to everywhere but the source. The gospel of John starts, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. What John was saying, and he's talking about Jesus, is that in the beginning, God, through the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, had perfect community. God did not need to create people so that he could just have people love him. God created people because he wanted to invite us into his perfect love. God was not lonely. And John grew up, and as we read his gospel, John had a love for Jesus. The end of the gospel of John, John is literally nestled up in the chest of Jesus. He loved Jesus. In fact, John wrote in his gospel, he described himself as the one Jesus loved. Isn't that kind of funny? I mean, could you imagine you're a gospel writer, and you describe yourself, I am the one Jesus loved. That's Peter. I am the one Jesus loved. Now, we joke about that a little bit, but I think some of us, we need to walk in with a little bit more swagger, with a little bit more confidence that that John had. You are the one Jesus loved. I am the one Jesus loved. That is my identity. That is who I am, and that is who you are today if you follow Jesus. Now, why is that powerful? I want you to think about when Jesus died. And he was crucified. You know the only person who didn't run away like a scared little toddler? It was John. It was John. The one Jesus loved was the one who didn't run away. You know who ran away and denied Jesus three times? Peter, the one who was confident and said, I'm going to follow you forever. Why? Because Peter lived the majority of his life trying to achieve an identity rather than receiving an identity. In fact, it wasn't to the point till after Jesus resurrected and Jesus looked Peter in the face and he said, do you love me? And he asked him three times to, rem- to remind Peter that he denied him three times, but also to remind Peter, it's not because of your performance. I love you even despite of your performance. Our identity is received. In the secret place, your identity is cemented that you are God and God's alone. God's alone. So the next time you're stressed, the next time you feel pressure, go to God, not your numbing technique. What happens in the secret place? Here's the second thing. You will find strength. This is what Jesus found in the secret place. And this is not just like a hoorah type of strength. This is an inner strength that says no matter what I'm facing this morning, whatever I'm facing today, God is with me. God is for me. And I can walk through this, not because of my strength, because of God's strength. David, in scripture, uh, there's this one story where David's wife and his kids and the wives and kids of his uh, warriors that were in battle with him, all their, uh, they get stolen or kidnapped, their wives and kids. And when this happens, there's a portion in scripture that says, David took a step back and he strengthened himself in the Lord. I mean, imagine that moment. Imagine your kids and your family get kidnapped. What's the first thing David did? He strengthened himself in God. I gave a story a couple weeks ago talking about David and his son was trying to kill him and take over uh, his kingdom. Talk about complicated family dynamics. Here's what David said in Psalm chapter 3. And let this just be an encouragement to you, whatever you're facing. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. Come on, you struggling sleeping at night? Read that verse. 
I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. Come on, David. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. David, in his hardest time, what does he do? He goes to God. We go to others. We go to social media. Before you go to bed, where are you going? Are you stressed? Are you anxious? Are you depressed? Go to God. He wants to sustain you. He's fighting on your behalf. And what I love about this prayer, this is not a casual prayer when you don't get the parking spot you want. This is a cry of the heart. Where do you need God today? Where do you need strength? Where do you need hope? What are you believing God for? Is there a family member who is far from God? It is time to cry out. Is your marriage on the rocks this morning? It's time to cry out. Are you struggling financially? It is time to cry out and seek the Lord. He wants to fight for you. Where does your confidence come from this morning? Does it come from the fact that you're just awesome and you're amazing and you have great discipline and you do great when it comes to habit stacking? Or is your confidence in God? Lastly, what happens in the secret place? You will find courage. You see, the secret place is not always a peaceful place. It's a time where you can cry out to God and you can give him your doubts and you can give him your fears. You don't have to pretend to be anything to God because he already knows who you are. So be honest with God when you're in the secret place. Tell him that you need him. I love this quote from Haddon Robertson. Where was it that Jesus sweat great drops of blood, not in Pilate's hall, nor on his way to Golgotha, It was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Had I been there and witnessed that struggle, I would have worried about the future. If he is so broken up when all he is doing is praying, I might have said, what will he do when he faces a real crisis? Why can't he approach this ordeal with calm confidence of his three sleeping friends? Yet when the test came, Jesus walked to the cross with courage, and his three friends fell apart and fell away. The world desires spotlight, but God does his greatest work in the darkness. This is where God shapes you. This is where God forms you. This is where God works in your life. The darkness is a blessing when you're not ready for the blessing you're asking for. You see, the blessing you're asking for is actually a curse when you're not ready for it. In the privacy of darkness, God prepares you for the work that he wants to do in the spotlight. So what do you need to do? You need to access The secret place. You see, this message did not start 15 minutes ago. This message started years ago. This message was prepared and formed. Every single week I stand up. There is a difference when I preach when I'm prayed up and when I'm not. There's a difference of what the Holy Spirit does when we are spiritually prepared than when we're not spiritually prepared. You see, God wants to work in your life, but some of you, you're running on E. It's time to fill yourself up, and that comes from the secret place. Every single Saturday night, I plead with God that he would move in your life this morning. I plead with God that there would be a tangible presence of the Holy Spirit when you walk through the doors. That even if you're not into Jesus, you would not be able to walk in here and say, Man, I felt God today. It wasn't emotionalism. It was the manifest presence of God literally in this space where the Holy Spirit, even if you don't know who the Holy Spirit is, is speaking to you today. Some of you are far from God today, and this is the message you need to hear because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. He's saying, draw close to me. Get to the secret place. I have something for you, and I want to help you experience it. If you want to live a great public life, it starts in 
the secret place. You know, the Romans, they persecuted Christians right after Jesus ascends into heaven. And they were terrible. They were terrible to Christians. We think we're persecuted. They were persecuted, okay? I mean, these Romans, they would take women, children, and uh, uh, males, anybody. And they would literally put animal skins on their bodies. And they would throw them into a pit. And they would have animals just shred them. They would kill. They would persecute. But Christianity spread across the Roman government at this time because the people were being persecuted. Why? Because the Romans, they loved a noble death. A noble death. If you were a Roman citizen, you did not want to die in your sleep. You wanted to die for a cause. And as these Christians were being persecuted and they were being martyred, they looked at them and they said, they're not renouncing their faith. They're continuing to stand firm even when we persecute. Where in the world do they get that power? It was the secret place. Where are you getting your power? We live today, and I don't know if you know this, but there are women in Iran who are leading the church. And every single day, their churches are growing. And these private churches, and they have to wake up living a life where they know that day they could be killed. They could be raped. They could be stolen from, but they are wrestling with God and building his kingdom in the Middle East, and they will serve God no matter what. Where do you get this type of resolve? It's in the secret place. You got to get to the secret place. You got to connect with God. He wants to know you, and he wants to help you live this out in your life. We are one year in as a church, and if we're going to see God do all that I believe he wants to do in this valley, it is not a half-hearted Christianity who shows up once a month. It's a group of people who say, I'm all in with my time, my talent, my resources. God, you literally get everything because I am building your kingdom, not my own. It's acknowledging that there is nothing more powerful and nothing more important than knowing God in a deep way and building his kingdom. Because I want to tell you something. Your car isn't coming with you to eternity. Your house is not coming with you to eternity. I don't care how much kale you eat and how much you exercise. You will die, but you can live a life that impacts eternity. You got to get to the secret place. Connecting with God is the key to whatever you're pursuing this morning. You need wisdom? Go to the secret place. You're trying to build a business? You're trying to learn more about leadership? John Maxwell's brilliant. Go to God first. You're having struggles with your marriage? Before you go to your friends? Go to God. Who are you going to first? Let it be going to God first. So here's a question for you. How often should we go to the secret place? Not a trick question. Often, okay? I am going to rapid fire some verses off for you right now. Uh, Let's start with Luke chapter 5. And uh, here's what we're going to do over these next few verses. When I get to the orange word, you're going to say it with some power and passion. All right? Luke chapter 5, 16. But Jesus withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Let's go to our next verse. Mark 1, 35. Very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a? Where he prayed. Let's go to the next one, Emily. Luke chapter 5, 15 through 16, our teaching text today. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Now wait, let's just pause there. Jesus, when when more people follow us, we want more people to follow us. We don't withdraw. Imagine Jesus, he's on Instagram and people just start following. He's like, close my account. Jesus, he he goes away. Let's look at our next verse in, in Luke. About eight days after Jesus said, he took Peter, John, and James with him and he went up to a mountain to? Next verse. Matthew 14, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Let's go to the next one, Emily. Keep it going. Luke chapter 6, one of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and he spent, I said the first word, I'm sorry, <laughs> praying to God. That is on me. I apologize. But it doesn't stop there. Let's go to the next one. 
Jesus went with his disciples to the place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit there while I go over here and Jesus often withdrew and went to the secret place. Jesus, God in the flesh, often went to the secret place. Frequently went to the secret place. Can I ask a question? How much more do you need to go there? Jesus needed it. I think we need it. Pastor John Tyson has an awesome chart uh, that I love, and uh, here's a picture of it. Basically, what happens in our life is is God downloads purpose in us. When we get that purpose downloaded, uh, we need to withdraw. When we withdraw, we're receiving power in our spirit to execute what God has for us, and that's what Jesus did. Received his purpose, and then he would withdraw, and he would live it out with power. If you don't know your purpose this morning, if you don't know how God has wired you, as a church, we're passionate about helping you do that. In fact, tonight at 5 p.m., we have something called the Growth Track, where I would encourage you to come back tonight, 5 o'clock. We're going to teach you about your spiritual gifts, how you can get plugged in, and how you can start building God's kingdom and living the life that God has for you. Because we want to help you take your next step in your walk with Jesus. Jesus knew his calling. He knew that in order to fulfill it, he needed to withdraw, to recharge, to get God's power, and then live it out. If you don't have the spiritual rhythm in your life, it's time to build it. Because if you don't, you are going to be susceptible to what the world is susceptible to. In fact, here's what Satan's greatest goal is for your life. It's that you don't access the secret place. He wants to distract you. That's what he wants to do. He does not want you to get in your prayer closet or your car or your office and get on your hands and knees and just say, God, I desperately need you. Satan will distract you with pleasure, with work, with business, with relationships. He will do anything he can to get you from connecting with God. I know what some of you are thinking today. Josh, I'm busy. I got a lot going on. I got school. I got jobs. I got kids. Maybe you got a new baby coming. I feel that because we're having a baby in four weeks. I'm like, oh my Lord, all right? Parents, do you know what your kids need most? They need you to have a strong prayer life and a powerful relationship with God because that will enable you to be the best parent possible. That's what your kids need. That's what your spouse needs. That's what your community needs. That's what this world needs. There was a woman, her name was Susanna Wesley. She had 19 kids. My goodness. But Susanna was passionate about connecting with God. Her husband would randomly leave for months on end. He went to prison a couple of times, and she just has kids everywhere. She had 19 kids, so she doesn't have too much time. She said the only time that she got to spend with God, and when she knew that she needed to go to the secret place, She would literally put her apron over her head in the kitchen. And her kids knew, if that apron is over mom's head, you do not talk to mom. Because mom was in the secret place. You know what those prayers did? Those prayers grew up children who were passionate and loved Jesus Her prayers changed the course of history because she raised kids who loved Jesus, two of them. One was an incredible worship leader. One of them was one of the greatest revivalists in history, John Wesley. You don't have time to not get to the secret place. Are your kids far from God? Pray. Are you struggling this morning? Pray. Get to the secret place. Hudson Taylor started a great movement in China where people were coming to know Christ. He would work day and night to spread the gospel. And everyone started to notice that Hudson worked so much. And they asked the question, how in this world, how in the world is this dude doing what he's doing? Like, where does he have the time to ever connect with God? And his daughter, years and years and years later, shares a story. They lived in a place um, where they all slept in the same room because it was so small. 
And she said, every morning, we would hear my dad wake up in the same room. He would go into the corner of the room, and he would switch a little lamp on at 2 a.m. And with a little light, he would spend time with God. And God used him to make such an incredible impact. And God wants to use you to make an incredible impact. And not only that, God wants you to live a life where you don't have to live how everybody else is living. God doesn't want you to have the stress. He doesn't want you to have the anxiety. He doesn't want you to have the depression. At the name of Jesus, it must bow. The question is, are we lifting up that name today? Or are we trying to do what everybody else does? We have to get to the secret place. Guys, this is going to look different depending on your life. When you got small kids or bigger kids, empty nesters, no kids, whatever it is. But it is time for us as a church to get to the secret place. Let us be a church that is built and marked on prayer. I do not want this church to be built on the talent of us or others. This built This church is built on prayer because prayer is the difference between the best we can do and the best God can do. And if we're going to see a move of God in this city, it is started and sustained through prayer. So let's get to the secret place because you have no idea what is hanging in the balance of you connecting with God. You have no idea how your college can change, this valley can change, your family can change when you get to God and you pray and ask God to open up heaven and say, God, I want to move here. I want to see you move here. I want to see you move now. God, we live in a world where people are turning their backs on you, where people do not believe in the power of your word. God, we need you in our country. We need you in this city. We need you in our family. God, I don't care how much wealth I have. I don't care how great my relationships are. God, I desperately need you more than anything else. So let's go to the secret place. Some of you, you've never made a decision to follow Jesus today. That is your first step. You've never given him your life. You've never given him your sins. It's time to take that step today. To say in front of God, I'm sorry for my sin. I am placing my trust in Jesus that he did it through the cross for the finishing work for me. You know what Jesus says? That after you make a decision to follow him, he calls you to go public with your faith through baptism and to tell the whole world that you are a follower of Jesus, that you are doing life with God. And we got some people this morning who are gonna be taking their next step through uh, baptism, but I truly believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, there are people in this room today, you've made a decision to follow Jesus, but you've never taken the next step of baptism, and that is the obedient step that you're called to take today. Now let me give you a quick caveat. Baptism doesn't mean you're gonna be perfect. Don't tell me, hey Josh, I'm waiting to get baptized because I got to get my life together. That's stupid because that's not what baptism's about. Baptism is recognizing that when you go under the water, that's your old self. When you come up out of the water, that is your new self. Your new self is not defined by your actions. Your new self isn't even defined by your obedience. Your new self is defined by Christ's righteousness on the cross that you get to receive today. So if you've never been baptized, and it was your decision if you're baptized as an infant, okay, but God calls you to get baptized as an adult when you've made the decision because you can't make a decision as a baby. If you've never taken that step today, I'm gonna encourage you, do it. We got shorts, we got t-shirts, we got towels. You may not have come here prepared to get baptized, but God was ready. And it's time to take that step today. So would you go ahead and stand to your feet right now? I'm gonna close this out in prayer and then we're gonna sing a song asking that God's blessing would be on our church like it was in 2023, that it'll continue to be years going forward and his blessing would be on your family and your life as well. If you're comfortable, I'd encourage you just to go ahead and open up your hands like this and receive this prayer this morning. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your presence. Today, you get all of us, Lord. We surrender everything to you. God, you get our lives. You get our money. You get our time. You get our talent. Jesus, we surrender everything to you. You died a public death, and we are going to follow you publicly. And God, we're going to follow you publicly by spending time in the secret place. 
God, thank you for what you've done over the last year. We pray with confidence, believing that you're going to continue to work in the future, and we can't wait to see what you're going to do through every person in this room, believing that you can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, and we pray this with confidence, and the church said, amen. Hey, what's up, everyone? My name is Jess. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. We're so glad to have you. And hey, if you made a first time decision to follow Jesus today, we are so excited for you. It is the best decision that you will ever make. I wanna encourage you to go to our website, purposearizona.com slash connect card, and you'll see a connect card on the website. Go ahead and fill that out. It gives us a little bit of information about you and helps us come alongside you and support you as you start this journey. Also, if you just wanna connect with our church or if you wanna invest financially in what God is doing here in the Valley, all of the information is on the website, purposearizona.com. And lastly, we meet in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. at Desert Edge High School, and we'd love for you to join us. Be sure to follow us on social media for any other updates. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.